Hello, everybody. Today is day 270, and we're concluding the reading of the New Testament with the book of Malachi, the complete book, chapter 1 through 4. Now, Malachi bridges a gap between it and the New Testament. There is a 400-year gap where there is no prophetic light, no uh, prophets speaking, no angelic visitations. There is complete, utter silence uh, during this period of time <clears throat> before the coming of Jesus Christ, as we will begin to read tomorrow uh, in the New Testament Gospels. Now, Malachi is the final book in the Old Testament, a final word. And this word is that which concludes and yet points to both two events, the coming of Jesus Christ in his first advent, and it also identifies his second coming at the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, there are 14 accusations from God in the book of Malachi. There are 10 rebellious responses or answers uh, by uh, the uh, people uh, to God, and uh, 32 specific sins are laid down uh, in these four chapters. He, God accuses them of uh, paying lip service. They're going through the motions. It's just pure dead religion. Um, he says you're bringing inferior sacrifices uh, just to get by. Yes, you're weeping and crying, but it's purely pretense. There is nothing of the heart. You're bringing lame and sick and blind animals as sacrifices. Leftovers, really, is what God's identifying. And he challenges them by saying, hey, listen, go give that a try with your governors, with your political leaders, and see how they respond uh, if you're to do that. And then God warns that he will send a curse. Now, this is conflicts with a lot of people's opinion about God that he doesn't curse. But again, many times God says, you are cursed with a curse. And he speaks about him personally uh, assigning this to those who break his covenant uh, or who will reap the consequences for the rebellion. Uh, he, he especially identifies one interesting area uh, where a curse is hinged to it, and it has to do with tithing and offerings. When we give of what God requires, what God's uh, overlay here is, is that God owns everything. You and I own nothing. We are merely managers of those resources that he's entrusted to us. To demonstrate our awareness that we don't own anything, the tithe has been established of which we give back to God what is already his, and it is a demonstration of both faith and uh, an, an, an assurance that, that we will reap the rewards uh, as we trust him uh, in managing those uh, beautiful things that he has given to us. Uh, he asked the question, God says, will a man, will a person rob God? They said, how have we robbed you? And he says, listen, you have robbed me with the tithe and the offering. Uh, it's the only time in all of the Bible that I can identify where God invites his people to prove him, to try him. Um, normally we see this as a testing God, but in the context of this passage, God is saying, hey, this is an area I'm inviting you to try me, to prove me, and what I'm saying here to see that it is accurate. And he says, if you will bring, bring that, that tithe in the storehouse, it's mine anyways, and if you don't, you're robbing me. But he says, bring it into the storehouse. The storehouse we recognize as uh, the temple. That was the means by which this, the leaders, the priests were taken care of. And the work of God was um, uh, continued on, was supported. And so we make that application today. Bring your tithe to the storehouse. And so the storehouse for us is going to be the place that we receive our spiritual food and support. That would be the local church. It's there by we, means that we support the workers, the spiritual workers and overseers, the shepherds, and at the same time, it's the means by which 
we um, uh, are able to support the work and the ministry of God, justice with the temple. And he says, so bring that tithe to the storehouse. And so there'll be food in my house. That food in the house is, you know, the spiritual provision, the bread and the manna from heaven that we can provide, the spiritual nourishment to those who are being supported by it. And then he says, uh, Try me, the, try me in this and see. That is, I'm, he's almost a dare here to do this. And he says, see if I won't open the windows of heaven. Th this suggests an enormous provision, supply, that the, your source is going to come. God will see that which has been given in faith, the tithe representing 10%, offerings over and above. And God is saying, listen, I will see what you do and I... And I'm going, he speaks about this book of remembrance. I, I think this is the most, it's the only, it's the place where God says, hey, I'm, I'm keeping record. I'm observing the things that you do and I will not forget. So don't think that you and I serving, loving, helping, ministering or giving sacrificially that God is going to forget. No, there's a book of remembrance and he's going to, uh, he meditates upon that. So he says, I'm going to open the windows of heaven. Think of what that must mean because of all the resources of heaven, all of the riches of heaven. He says, I'm going to open the heavens and I'm going to pour out on you such a blessing that you will not be able to contain. It's an overabundance. It's going to come from every direction. It's not just a monetary thing, but I believe it entrusts, you know, joy and and um, and, and also protection and, and and just an enormous amount of uh, of the abundance of God. He says you're not going to have room to receive it. It, it, it. You won't be able to contain all that God's and, and almost as if to say that I'm giving you more as if you will be able then to bless others with greater resources. And he said, I'm going to rebuke the devourer and you are going to be called blessed. Rebuke the devourer. Who do you think the devourer is? And God says, I will take note of that. He talks about marriage and the sacredness of marriage in this book, probably the most uh, clearly defined aspect of it in which he says it's a picture of a covenant and that covenant is both between you and that marriage relationship, but also the covenant relationship, that picture of Jesus who's married to the church. And, and God says, I'm a witness. I witness the union in this marriage. Uh, and he's ad admonish admonishing uh, husbands to love the wife of their youth, uh, that you've been made one as a result of that, and that God declares here his hatred for divorce because it's a breaking of that covenant and that picture of Jesus in the church. God expresses being weary and tired of the endless uh, routines of religious uh, religiosity here uh, saying everyone who, the people are saying everyone who does good uh, or who does evil is good in the sight of God. And God is repulsed by this. Uh, he says, I'm the Lord, I don't change. I'm not amending. Uh, my standards and my ways. He says, return to me and I'll return to you. God's invitation that if we will dare to press into God, God says, I'll see and I will come to you. And then the, finally, he talks about the great day of the Lord. Two distinctions here. You're going to see references to the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus, all contained in this fantastic book. The great day uh, of the Lord is the return of Christ in wrath and in judgment. Um, when he comes with fire, when, when he comes uh, to execute judgment upon those who have been against him and his people. Uh, Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. This obviously, Elijah didn't die, but the reference here is that Elijah is going to be coming back uh, and he will be here during uh, at the conclusion of the, uh, of the great tribulation period, he will be a witness. And um, so all of these references are just so many numerous ones here. What an exciting book as it deals with both the context of the events that were transpiring at that time, as Malachi writes this, events coming in the, the fulfillment of Jesus the Messiah coming the first time into the world, and the conclusion of all things in the great day of the Lord.